14, and uh, we're going to take a look at the harvest of, uh, of God's wrath, which probably is not, um, if uh, often a pastor kind of hopes that people will be, you know, as we teach through the word, <coughs> people will be reading ahead. I don't, I don't know if I want you reading ahead. You might not come if you, uh, if you read ahead and see what we're going to be covering week to week. And this is one of those instances, again, not, uh, this is the kind of uh, subject material that you don't teach on if you teach topically and you choose, but when you teach through a book, you, you cover the whole counsel of God's word, and certainly this is part of uh, what John is trying to convey to us in terms of the revelation of, it's not the revelation of the end times, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ and who he is, and, um, and that we might know him and see him in a different way because of, uh, of this writing. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll jump in. <clears throat> Father, we pray that uh, you bless our time in your word, that you'd give us um, open hearts to, to hear, that our minds would be uh, focused and, Lord, uh, you'd be able to speak to us. And uh, we pray for uh, an impact, Lord, that uh, it would change our, our worldview, our perspective, what we see as the, the passion of our lives, Lord, because... Here we find that uh, in, in the end, this world is, is judged in a sense we're, we're on a sinking ship that's going down and, and we, want, we don't want to be living for it, but for living for the life that is uh, yet to come. So Lord, uh, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, in his book, A River Out of Eden, Richard Dawkins uh, writes uh, about an incident that happened in England where there was a school bus crash, and there were several children that were, uh, that were killed. Uh, Richard Dawkins is um, uh, a leading scientist and is a, a part of a group of what we call today uh, the New Atheist. And there are several, four or five, that uh, have written a series of books in the last three or four years that have all become bestsellers and so forth. And, of course, the, the idea is to come against uh, the Christian faith in particular, the Christian God in particular, and the idea that there is a God at all. And uh, so uh, Dawkins, when he uh, sees this uh, accident takes place, he's, he writes about it, uses it as an example in his book to actually prove in his mind that there is no God. Uh, at that same time, there was a priest that was interviewed by a newspaper to say, uh, basically, if, again, here's the, the issue. If you have a God that's a God of love and mercy, how does or why are these things allowed to happen, these, these tragedies? And, of course, that's, that's a comment that we get from our, our friends sometimes when we're trying to share with them, and they're observing terrible things that happen in the, uh, in the world. This is the answer of, uh, of the priest, and, again, it's from the book River Out of Eden, so I don't have a name for him. But uh, he said this, so the simple, in terms of why God would allow it, the simple answer is that we do not know why there should be a God who lets these awful things happen. But the horror of the crash to a Christian confirms the fact that we live in a world of real values, positive and negative. If the universe was just electrons, there would be no problem of evil or suffering. And, uh, and again, Dawkins, as I read the quote from him in a moment, it isn't a problem for him because he denies God. He denies good and evil. Everything is simply random chance uh, selection. But the, re the reality is suffering I is a problem, isn't it? And it's a problem for us because we're moral beings made in the image of God. Dawkins tries to cite these things and say they're, they are a reason to say that there is no God. I think at least what the priest is trying to say is, no, actually it's the fact that we're moved by it we're concerned over it, uh, shows the fact that there is a God and that we're made in his image. Let me read what uh, Dawkins writes, writes about it. He says, on the contrary, if the universe were just electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Don't you wish you had that worldview to start your day with uh, uh, each, and, uh, each and every day? 
That is the worldview of, uh, of the atheists. No reason, no rhyme, pitiless indifference to the things that are, uh, uh, are around him. But like I said, one of the lines he says there, in no sense of justice. But I think the opposite is true. We all, we all have a sense of, of justice. One of the reasons that certain television shows are very popular uh, on, uh, today uh, are, are ones that, uh, that have a sense of justice. There's a crime that's committed. It's investigated. Those people are arrested. It goes to trial, and the bad guys are found guilty, and everybody goes, right on, I like that show. Uh, you can imagine a show like that where, the, where the, they're caught and the bad guys got free every week. You know, I'd be like, <laughs> I'm not watching that show anymore. I don't like it. Why? Because I want a sense of justice where the bad guys get caught and the bad guys get punished and the innocent go free, where oppression against people is erased uh, and where there's an opportunity for everyone to have, uh, to have uh, freedom. There, by the way, just a little plug, there's a little... Uh, really powerful uh, show that's out there now in the theaters, uh, Inviticus, which is the story of Nelson Mandela and his rise to power in South Africa after 30 years in prison because of, uh, uh, of apartheid, uh, in prison simply because of the color of his skin. But when he was freed and then won the election to be the president of South Africa, he knew that the only way the country would survive is if he could convince everybody to forgive and, and to move on, which is exactly what he did and hired and retained the very people that persecuted him on his own staff and reached out to him. It's a powerful story. And we love to hear stories like that because we're moral beings made in the image of, of God. And what we're about ready to study about is the fact that in the end, in the very end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth, what we call the the battle, or really it's a series of battles, we call Armageddon. And, um, and it's bloody, and it's horrific, and there's a couple of word pictures that are used to help us uh, understand it. And uh, I say all of this in the preference because of the fact that when we read these things, sometimes we have a hard time reconciling in our mind uh, sweet Jesus, meek and mild, who, who healed the sick, who touched the leper, who raised the dead, who fed the poor, who reached out to the oppressed in that culture, women and children, and elevated them to a, a new and a noble status and did all of these things and then went to a Roman cross and died for our sins. And, and, it's, and you're going to tell me it's that same Jesus that is going to come back to planet Earth and reap a harvest of wrath against this world. And yes, he is. And that's the point of what John is writing about begins this, again, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ in saying you have to understand the Jesus that was here in human flesh has now resurrected. He's now in a glorified body. He now is once again the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's who it is that you pray for. That is your Savior. He is coming back again, and he will rule and reign on this earth, and all evil will be done away with. The bully on the block gets kicked out at the end. And uh, we have that sense of justice in us, but sometimes when it's portrayed, it's, uh, it can be rather, rather shocking. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the text. We're in verse 14, and we'll move on from there. But the first thing I think John wants us to see is that there's one primary person uh, in this harvest, and it's a, a harvest we'll look at in a, again in a few word pictures. Verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So, again, the primary person here is, um, receives the title, the Son of Man. Uh, we saw it used previously in chapter 1, verse 13. Uh, John there, the same writer, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. So again, Son of Man is a messianic title. John's already used it. He's already identified this is Jesus Christ that he is talking about. And, uh, and it's a title that Jesus used of himself more, more than in any other title, constantly referring to himself as, as the Son of Man, a messianic title that comes from, uh, from Daniel the prophet. The second thing about him now that he's identified the primary person is, is described, notice the description, he's on a, a white cloud. Sometimes we, um, we get the comment, comment or the comic uh, made uh, 
to us that what are you going to do in heaven? Just simply float around on clouds playing harps. And I think we've actually already seen from the book of Revelation, there's, a, there's actually some aspect of that where that does, we've got a lot of harp playing and a lot of music going on uh, in heaven. Uh, and here's this image of the Son of Man or of Jesus on a white cloud. But again, uh, this, this isn't... Um, uh, something out of a Steve Martin movie or anything. This is not the white cloud that drifts by that we see uh, overhead. It's really a reference to the, what we call the Shekinah glory of God. It's the cloud of God's presence that led the children of Israel uh, you know, through the wilderness wandering and, uh, and it's, uh, that would appear then as a pillar of fire at night. It's the same white cloud that when Solomon prayed for the temple to be dedicated, the whole temple was filled with a cloud and it was so powerful the priests could not continue in their, their duties. They were just simply overtaken by it. That's the cloud we're, we're talking about here, a symbol of God's presence. And when it's there, it's a symbol of his righteousness uh, and his morality. Uh, again, Daniel combines these two things, the title with this idea of Jesus on the clouds in Daniel 7, 13. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, there's the title that we've already mentioned, coming, notice, with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancients of days, which is, a, a, again, a reference for God the Father. And they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. So Jesus receives the kingdom that will go on for uh, ever and ever. And notice he comes like the Son of Man, and he comes with the clouds. Again, an Old Testament concept that John makes reference to here. Notice also he's wearing a golden crown, which is a mark of the conquering king. And there's only one exception to that, and that's Burger King. There everybody gets a golden crown. But other than that one exception, when you see the golden crown, it's a reference to a uh, a conquering king. Now, uh, we have a reference here, and uh, I want to read from Revelation 9, 9 11. And, and by the way, I'm looking forward to getting chapter 19 when Jesus comes back to planet Earth and establishes his, uh, his kingdom, and we can be, move beyond the wrath, the wrath of God. I'm looking forward to that. But uh, uh, it says there in Revelation 19 11, John says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. Again, this is all a reference to Jesus. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name that, uh, written that no one knew except himself. Uh, and again, down to verse 16, it says, And on his robe and on his, his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus comes back. He comes back as the conquering uh, king. And again, that's what John, I think, is trying to get us to see. When it comes to the final end, and it comes to the wrath of God, Jesus is the primary person. He's the one that's coming, basically, that's going to delve out the, the punishment to the bad guys in, uh, in that sense. And notice the purpose in his coming, we see, is that he holds a sharp sickle. And uh, this is contrasted with, again, Jesus in terms of when he came the first time, he came, and in, in his hands, he, as again, touched the leper. You know, he healed people. He multiplied the loaves of bread. Uh, it's in his hands that he took Roman spikes as he was nailed to a cross. A very different image because that was the purpose in his coming. Uh, he came to die for the, uh, the sins of the world. Paul says he, uh, uh, again, uh, came to die the, the righteous for the unrighteous. Paul says to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but raised to life by the Spirit. That was his purpose in his coming. But it's very different when he comes again. When he comes again, he's not multiplying loaves of bread. He's not healing the sick. He comes with a sharp sickle uh, in his hand. That's the image. That's the picture. And it's because there's going to be a, a, a harvest that, uh, that takes place. So uh, the primary person, again, of the harvest is the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And the purpose of his coming is seen in what he holds in his hand. Secondly, in verse 15 and 16, there's a proclamation about the harvest that's, uh, that's made. Another angel, verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap. 
for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So again, the proclamation basically says the time has come. There's a, there's a said time. Paul says in terms of Jesus coming the first time, when time had fully come, in other words, when it was the exact moment for Jesus to be born, he was born. Uh, we talk about the fact that, that when Jesus rides in on a donkey uh, to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and the people wave the palm branches and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying, You are the Messiah. You're coming exactly the way Zechariah said you would come. And he came on the exact day that Daniel said that he would come. Daniel said from the issuing forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from that day you can count off 170, <laughs> 2,880 days, I think it is, you can mark them on your calendar, and on that day the Messiah would come, and Jesus came on that exact day, exact timing. God's plan of redemption is on a schedule. It happens on the schedule as predicted, and now in the end, when Jesus comes again the next time, it will happen exactly on a schedule as well. From the start of the tribulation, it will be seven years. Again, we don't know the day or the hour of the rapture when we're going to be with the Lord, when the Lord comes for the church. But once the tribulation starts, anybody that's here that's got a calendar that's clicking away know exactly when he's returned. This angel says uh, it is time for this, this harvest to take place. <clears throat> the second thing, the proclamation states that the, the earth is ripe. So the, the question is, what is it ripe for? Uh, and there's a couple of opinions. And... Um, I was hoping I could just get on one side or the other, <laughs> and, I, I'm, and I'm and I'm 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 leaning a little I'm leaning a little heavier to one than the other. But uh, uh, I did a uh, I went through this whole thing and I I read it in the Greek and I looked everything. I read six or eight different guys, and the problem was it was like split 50-50. So one of, one of the issues is this: when Jesus comes back in the exact time at the end, it's a harvest. He's got the sharp sickle in his hand. What does that really mean? What is he harvesting? What is he bringing in? And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Now, the next picture after this, there's a gathering as opposed to a harvest in its grapes, and they're going in the wine press of God's wrath. We're going to assume that's bad. And when we see the outcome of it, we'll know it's very bad. So, but what about this picture, uh, which again, the word ripe is an indication that it's grain, that it's ripe, so it's a different image. So there are those that would say, this is a reference to this worldwide revival that's going on where we have potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of people coming to faith in Christ, and that's the harvest. Jesus comes with his sickle, and, and basically it's a picture of him drawing them to himself. And, and that's a view held by uh, a lot of people that I respect. And they would read a couple of verses to go along with it to say this idea of harvesting has to do with the harvest of souls. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest, people to go out and share the gospel. John 4, 35, Jesus says, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? But I say, do you lift up your eyes and look at the fields? For they are already white for harvest, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. And our text says, the harvest of the earth is ripe. So it's therefore ripe for a worldwide revival. And again, that's the position uh, of, a lot of, uh, of a lot of folks, that uh, that's part of what happens at the very end, takes place, uh, again, just prior to Jesus Christ coming back to planet earth. The other view is, is, the, is uh, the extreme opposite, of course, and that is Jesus Christ is coming back and it's for a time of a harvest, but it's for a harvest in terms of his wrath uh, against, again, uh, what we'd say a Christ-rejecting world. Uh, in general terms, we've said more specifically and made a case for the fact that what this is really all about and stated elsewhere is that this horrific time of the great tribulation, God is pouring out his wrath against a Christ-rejecting world because of the blood of the martyrs, all of the men and the women and children for the centuries that had to shed their blood because of their faith, as continues today. 
Again, there were more martyrs for their faith in Jesus Christ in the last century than all other centuries combined. This is not something that is letting up. It's something that seems to be getting worse. And, uh, and Jesus Christ comes back because, as we saw, they're in heaven saying, How long, O Lord, you know, before you avenge our blood? Uh, and this takes place. So one says that there's a harvest of souls and uh, uh, of those that are righteous, and it's a good thing. But the other view says... No, it's actually a harvest of judgment. And that's, this is the side I'm, I kind of have a tendency to lean on because of, uh, of two things. Because of one Greek word and because of one direct quote that's here from the Old Testament. The Greek word is ripe. Uh, and, and, uh, and what it's saying is that we think of ripe like, hey, that looks good. It's ripe. I'll pick it and I'll eat it. You wouldn't want to pick this. When it says it's ripe, it means that it's withered. In other words, it was ripe. But it's way beyond that now. It's the same word Jesus uses when he's uh, walking down the Mount of Olives with his disciples and he curses a fig tree. And it says that it doesn't say that it's ripe. It says that it withered. That's the same word. In other words, the crop comes in and it does get ready. But you've got to pick it within a certain period of time. And if you don't, then it begins to kind of go to seed and dry out and wither. That's the word that's used here. It's not the, really the, the word of something describing something that, hey, now it's ready, let's, let's go get it. It's saying that we're, we're way beyond that. We're way beyond that. And, uh, and what that says is that in terms of Jesus coming in judgment, he does it after waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and waiting until there's just... There's nothing else he can do. So it's a, it's a picture of the, of the patience of, of God. Because it's God's will that none perish, that all come to eternal life. Tribulation could have happened in the 1700s. I mean, God could have orchestrated those events, 1800s, 1900s. It still hasn't happened. We, we, we think, I believe that we're very close to it because of the world events that we live in and the prophecies that have been fulfilled but uh, Jesus is waiting very patiently. So that's the word. The, the cross-reference that I wanted to read to you is, uh, uh, is this. And uh, I may have just jumped a couple slides on you, on you Kathy. Uh, but uh, let me read, read those for you. I've got a couple of other verses that, again, this idea of, of, uh, of harvest and how it can mean a negative as well as a positive. In Matthew 13, Jesus talks about a parable of a king that goes out and sows seeds uh, and he's waiting for his wheat to come in. The enemy comes and he sows out tares or weeds that look like wheat and they're going to grow up together uh, and that's the issue. Uh, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seeds in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Jesus is saying this is what the kingdom of God is going to be like. There's going to be people that look like Christians that are really not Christians. They're going to grow up together. It's like, what should we do? Should we go and try to take them out? He says, no, let them grow up together. Once they, in the end, you'll be able to see what produces fruit, what doesn't, what is the real thing, and what is not. Verse 30 in that passage, Jesus says, let both grow together until the harvest. At the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barns. So now you've got a harvest that's a harvest of judgment. Again, so you can use this word and look at the words of Jesus and say it's a harvest of righteous coming to faith in him, but you can also say that word harvest definitely has a negative connotation as well. Plus, you have the word ripe and when we understand what it means. And then again, there are hundreds of times that John is quoting the Old Testament. Not a few times, there are hundreds of times. And this is one of them. And if we look at the quote, go back to the Old Testament, uh, very interesting. It's uh, Joel chapter 3, verse 12 to 17. There the prophet Joel, talking about the tribulation, same context, says, Let the nations be wakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Let me talk a little bit about the valley of Jehoshaphat so this makes a little more sense. Uh, if you see a picture of Israel today, typically... You see a picture of the Temple Mount area taken from the Mount of Olives looking down. Very steep valley going up the other side. You see the Temple Mount. You see the, 
the dome of, uh, of the rock, that gold dome, the al Mosque, and you see, and, and that's what you're looking at. On the other side is the old city. If you keep looking, you'll see the high rise in the modern cities of Israel in the, in the, diff in the distance. That steep valley from the Mount of Olives right there is the Kidron Valley, also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat or the Valley of Decision, because when kings conquered Jerusalem, we read about uh, ancient history, we know that happened many times, typically they would then set up above the city looking down on it and they would carry out their judgments upon the other kings and princes and rulers that were there. It became known as the Valley of Decision. So that's what that's made, being made reference to. And we're going to talk about this valley a little bit more uh, in a moment. Uh, but let's go back and read what Joel says again. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat in the future. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Joel says that, that God is going to sit to judge in this place all the nations. At one point in time in the future, Jesus talks about this judgment in Matthew 25. We're also going to read that passage in, uh, in a moment. Put in the sickle for the harvest is right. There's our direct quote. So it's not a mystery in terms of what is John referring to. He is quoting this passage from Joel. And it goes on, come, go down, for the wine press is full. Well, that's our next illustration, the wine press of God's wrath. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. It's because of that word, ripen, that quote from Joel, I have a tendency to think that what's being spoken about here in terms of when Jesus is, comes again and he has a sharp sickle in his hand in this picture, what's speaking about is his, he's going to carry out judgment. And, uh, and he is going to sit eventually in the valley of decision and judge the nations uh, at that point. Uh, but there's uh, some pretty horrific events that take place uh, just prior to that. The point is, one primary person that's dealt with, with the harvest. Again, John is trying to help us see who Jesus really is. Not meek and mild Jesus, not just a suffering servant of Isaiah 53. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, which he did, and he died for our sins. And John says, and that's good, and you need to know that. That's what you place your faith in. But he not only died, he rose, and now he is glorified. And he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is coming again. And when he comes, he has a sharp sickle in his hand, and when he comes, he's going to judge people and it's going to be horrific and uh and again he's trying to get us to see the revelation of of jesus christ john's not so much concerned that we can tell our friends in detail all the events that are going to be happening during the tribulation period although those things are delineated for us but he wants us to really understand who jesus is so there's uh, he is the primary person of the harvest secondly there's a proclamation about the harvest of the earth is, that's made. And, it, uh, and again, it has everything to do with uh, God's wrath. And then third, there's a picture uh, is given of God's judgment. That's verse 17 to 20. Then another angel came out of heaven, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Uh, another angel came out of the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust the sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So again, the... Again, chapter 14 is a parenthesis, a panoramic view of what we're actually we're going to be looking at in, uh, in chapters 16, 17, 18, and, and 19. But uh, here, uh, a picture of an angel who's got charge of fire. Verse 18 says it's a special angel who had power over fire. And uh, I think this is a, a direct reference as we look back as, 
Uh, again, it's angel. It's the angel of, uh, of the same kind that we've seen before. In chapter 8, we saw an angel who had charge over fire. I believe it's the same angel. There in chapter 8, verse 3, it says, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne of God. So again, he's got an incense, uh, uh, this whole thing that represents the prayers of the saints. Uh, he's the one that has this fire. And uh, what are the prayers of the saints? Well, verse 4, And the smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. The angel looked, uh, took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And judgment begins to get poured out. Why? Because of the prayers of the saints. We, again, we don't often think of it that way when we pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we're praying for. God's holiness, God's right, righteousness, his justice will get met out here on, on the earth. And, uh, and what that means is, is that, that God's judgment and his wrath, that when it's poured out, is in response to the prayers of, of God's people. We may not think about it right now, but apparently when Jesus is doing this, we're going right on. It's about time. Did you ever have a bully in the playground growing up? Didn't you just, somebody would come along and pop that guy? Isn't there a bigger bully somewhere? You know, take this guy, guy out. We all have that, that, that's, uh, that sense of justice. It just occurred to me. I was thinking about uh, when Joshua was about uh, four. That was the era of the, uh, uh, of the Karate Kid movies. That cost me a lot of money, yeah, by the way, because you know, Josh bugged me for about a year to take uh, karate lessons. So uh, one of the guys, uh, they had a little dojo right at Castle High School, right up the street, uh, Japanese International Karate Federation. So we went up there, and, it, and it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's $1,000 for two weeks or $300 for the year. It's, you know, it's not really, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's like, you, it's pretty hard not to sign up for the year. It's like that. So, you know, it's like, it's really expensive for a month, you know, but it's a great reduction if you just kind of bite the bullet. So we did and signed him up for the year and, uh, and he's going along. And of course, at four, you don't exactly drop them off. You're outside with all the other dads drawing stick figures is what you're doing of the kata that they have to learn and memorize, right? Because you've basically got to work with them during the week or he's just not going to. So we're all out there. And some guy's got a video camera, which was like a kind of a newer thing back in those days. It's like, oh, well, can I get a copy of that? You know, and uh, all the dads are outside trying to figure out how we're going to go home now and teach the kata to these kids, which is the uh, kata is like the series of moves that they have to learn as part of uh, advancing and so forth. But anyway, Josh was big for his age, and uh, he got paired up with one. Uh, there's some nasty little kids taking karate, by the way. And uh, this one kid, man, I mean, and they have to, you know, get ready. And then it's like one kid, it's like he's going to give this command. And then somebody's that kid's going to punch. And the other kid better block or he's going to get it right here. Right. And at four, you're just going, I'm outside. Come on, block. Block. And I want to see my kid get smashed in the face because I know the kid he's standing opposite is going to try to smash him in the face. He's not like, I hope I have the right form. He's one of these kids going, ah, I'm going to pop this guy. He's like probably seven, but he's the same height as Josh, right? And I spent the whole time, the whole, that whole hour as he was paired up against this guy. You know, there's kick block. They go back and forth. And I'm just praying every time that he would, you know, get the block thrown, you know, do the right move. Uh, which he came close a couple of times, just spun right by him, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, we got through that. I hope he doesn't get paired up with that kid. <clears throat> I like to take the kid over my knee is what I'm thinking, you know. <clears throat> and um, we come back the next, the next week, the next lesson, and, um, and sure enough, here's this same kid, big black eye. Wised off to the wrong kid at school, you know, tried, to, tried, tried out his karate moves and the other kid, probably the same age, just popped him. And see, I wasn't going, oh, the poor guy, I hope it doesn't hurt too much. No, that kid was trying to punch my kid. It was like, I'm glad he got what he deserved, you know. <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, we're all going to be rejoicing 
of all the injustices, all the evil in this world, when Jesus Christ, who is the primary person of God's wrath, when he comes back and does this, this is very hard to read, but it's in response to all of our prayers. Because God has put a sense of justice uh, in, uh, in every one of us. But again, Revelation uh, chapter 10, verse 6, is where we have that prayer of the martyrs. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? I was reading through Psalm 79 this week, and, and I uh, noticed one of my own notes written at the top uh, that said the tribulation period, because if you want to read 70, Psalm 79 later, you'll, you'll see that there's an, an, a, a, an immediate affliction to uh, the Jewish people returning after the Babylonian captivity. But if you look at it, you can certainly see a far-reaching application in terms of the tribulation period. Verse 10 says this, Why should the nations say, Where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of, our, of the blood of your servants which has been shed. Uh, th there's been a lot of times in the period of God's people where they prayed that God would show up and stand up for them and avenge their, their blood. And, um, and that's going to happen uh, in, in the end. So this angel in our text says this is happening in, in response to the prayers of believers. Second thing, the picture involves a gathering of grapes. So certainly as uh, believers in Jesus Christ, there's to be fruit from our lives that can be seen. Again, this is just a metaphor talking about our characters and how we treat others and so forth. Uh, we need to walk the walk and, and talk the talk. There should be something that's seen in a transformation of our lives and so forth. We call that the, the uh, fruit. At the same time, the Bible talks about unbelievers will bear fruit as well. In other words, their evil will, will be seen. Paul says that the sins of some men precede them and others it trails behind them. I mean, there's some guys, you see them coming and you go, that guy definitely doesn't know the Lord. You know, he just, uh, and then there's other people, he seems like a very nice guy and you get to know him a little bit longer and go, no, he doesn't really know the Lord either. Precedes, you know, it shows up. It, uh, it shows uh, is, is the idea. Uh, but this idea of uh, gathering the grapes is a, uh, the metaphor that people's lives and nations are going to be judged because of their sin, because of their nations in terms of their, uh, their elected leaders, their character, their policies, things they've done. By the way, we're, we're just a little bit ripe ourselves in terms of a country uh, because of the abortion issue and the slaughter of the unborn and so forth uh, has been said on many occasions God doesn't judge the United States. He owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. We're just there, and that is just one issue. There are some, the United States is the primary producer of pornography around the world. We produce about 82% of it. Uh, there's over 40% of every hit on a computer is pornography. It's almost half. It is a billion, billion, billion dollar business around the world, and it's us that is producing it and putting it out there on the web. It's our courts that refuse to do any, anything about it. Uh, and in the end, God will judge nations as well as individuals because of the fruit of their lives. Uh, and that also is like a, a harvest. Now, I made reference to Matthew 25 previously about this idea, the valley of Kidron Valley, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision. In Matthew 20, 24 and 25, it's called the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city and he's teaching from up there, his guys, and he's telling them about the end times. He's telling them about the tribulation, everything that's going to happen. Uh, it talks about the fact that uh, in the middle uh, of that tribulation, the person we refer to as the Antichrist, who will be the world leader at that time, will set up an image of himself in the newly rebuilt uh, temple in Jerusalem. That image, as we've read, will come alive and will be worshipped and so forth. Jesus says, this was what was spoken of by the prophet Daniel, the abomination that causes desolation. And when it happens, then the Jewish remnant that's in Jerusalem should flee and get out into the wilderness of Judea. We've talked about this a, a, a few times. And of course, they're gonna, they will do that and God will supernaturally protect them he says, then he goes on, but at the end of all this time, then there's going to be a time of judgment. And he covers that in chapter 25. And he says this, 
When the Son of Man comes in his glory, I'm, I'm chapter 25, verse 31, I'm going to read to verse 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him. That's pretty awesome just in itself. All the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Jesus is saying in the future, after the tribulation, he will sit in the valley of decision. He and all of his holy angels, and he will judge the nations of the earth. And obviously by the conversation, he's judging individuals as well. What is he judging them on? Those that have survived the tribulation. Individuals that didn't take the mark, that survived the tribulation. He's judging them one thing. How did they treat the least of them, his brethren in the flesh, the Jews? Were they anti-Semitic or were they pro-Semitic? Did they help them during this great time of tribulation against them uh, because of the Antichrist trying to destroy them? Or did they help them? And they'll be judged on that alone. They're saying, we didn't do anything for you. He says, nope, in the way that you did it for the least of these, my brethren, that's what I'm going to judge you on. That's what gets you into the kingdom of God, the millennial kingdom of God. These are the people that will live and multiply uh, and, and live during this thousand year reign of Christ here on, on planet earth. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed in the everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, hell, the everlasting fire, was never prepared for man. It was for Satan and the devils that rebelled against God with him. Again, Jesus says, or excuse me, the New Testament says, it's not God's will that any should perish, but God allows each person their own free will choice. We're, we're made in God's image, which means we have a volitional choice, and we can either choose to love him, to know him, or to reject him. And, when, and if someone chooses that, uh, again, this is their fate. Verse 42, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me. A naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, the righteous into eternal life. A judgment in the valley of decision at the end of the tribulation period, as Joel said there would be, as Jesus describes how it's all going to go down and what that judgment will be uh, based upon. And in the end, there is a harvest of God's wrath. It's pictured like grapes being taken and put into a vat in order to produce wine. And that's the next thing we see, uh, the great wine press of the wrath of God. And it's meant to be a, a visualization of, uh, of what's What's going on here? Again, in those days, just as maybe you've seen uh, in uh, uh, somewhat today, modern things that, uh, that uh, take care of all of this, but in those days, all, that, uh, all those grapes were piled into that great vat. People would uh, hopefully wash their feet and then get up in there and smash those, uh, uh, those grapes down and so forth. Uh, and that's a picture of them being crushed is a picture of this judgment here at the end. Now in chapter 19, Again, the chapter in which we see Jesus coming back to planet Earth is there, is there in verse 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword 
that with it he should strike down the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So, again, Jesus coming back, the battle of Armageddon. He comes back. <clears throat> the nations of the earth have gathered there on the plains of Megiddo. Uh, many, many generals, many uh, military leaders over the years have fought battles there and said if there was ever a worldwide battle, it would have to be fought here just because of the, uh, the geographic lo location. And, uh, and it will one day. The nations of the earth will gather there. We'll look at this more detail when we get to it. Uh, they will turn and be believe that they can fight against Jesus Christ as he returns and he will destroy them with the breath of his mouth. Down in the plains of uh, present-day Jordan, uh, the area we call Petra, or Hebrew is Basra, is where, uh, because of a passage I'm about ready to read to you, we believe that's where the remnant, about a third of the Jews that survived this Holocaust against them, they're there, and Jesus then returns to them to save them from the forces of the Antichrist. But the same imagery is used of this idea of the wine press of God's wrath in that passage also. So I'm going to read to you, and I, I know I've read it before, but um, re repetition is not always a bad thing in terms of absorbing some of this information. Uh, I want to read to you again from Isaiah 63. Uh, there's where Isaiah tells us how this is going to all happen. And he begins by asking a question, the prophet does. In verse 1, he says, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. That's the first question. Who is this, the prophet says, that comes from Basra, who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? The answer, God says, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, is the Messiah that's coming from Basra. So the prophet asked another question then. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the wine press? Uh, and, and so here's the answer again. Second question, the Messiah is coming. You're great in your strength and your apparel. You're coming from Basra. Uh, and uh, why are your garments seem to be stained red? You know, why, why, is, why do you have this particular appearance? And, uh, and the Messiah says in verse 3, I have treaded the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all of my robes, for the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. That's Jesus, the conquering king. When he returns with his breath, he destroys the armies of the nations of the earth that are gathered on the plains of Megiddo. Second phase, immediately to save the Jewish remnant in Basra. Then he makes his way across the plains back to Jerusalem, as just described, his garment stained with the blood that, uh, that is there because of these armies. Eventually then, rising to the Mount of Olives, third stage, stands on the Mount of Olives, as ancient kings all did in the past, to declare his victory. And when he does, the Mount of Olives splits in twos. So we talk about the Armageddon, but it's a series of events that take, take place. And uh, we ask our, ourselves the question, how bad will it be? And that's given to us in the picture as well. This wine press is described as, uh, as instead of grape juice flowing out, it's blood that's flowing out. And it flows up to a height of about four feet and for a distance of roughly 185 or to 200 miles uh, is the idea. <clears throat> There's three different views, and they're all very plausible. One is that, where does that take place? Some would say it's a 200-mile radius or 185-mile uh, radius around the city of Jerusalem. And if you look at the Kidron Valley there, it's very steep, and, uh, and the bloodletting would be so bad, it would be four feet in the bottom of that valley. That's one plausible uh, answer to it. The other is interesting as well. 
If you measure from, when you say you're going to Israel or you're going to see all of Israel, you say from Dan to Beersheba. That's the furthest point in the north to the most southern point. That happens to be about 185 miles. Same thing. So it could indicate there's just bloodshed all over the, 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 whole, the whole nation when Christ comes back and is the primary vehicle of, of God's judgment. Uh, the other one is very interesting as well that uh, David Hawking points out, of course, David's uh, big on details, uh, and he points out the fact that if you, if you were to measure from the plains of Megiddo, the valley of Jezreel, where these nations are going to be gathered, and you were to look on it on a topographical map, map there would be a downhill flow uh, that, would, that would go and move its way uh, down towards Jerusalem, through the Kidron Valley. If you were to have pour enough water, it would run, in other words. And where it would keep running, past Jerusalem, past the Kidron Valley, out onto the plains of, of Jordan and to Basra. And the distance between those two is 185 miles. Very, very interesting. But uh, either way, uh, there's a horrific bloodshed that, uh, that we see take place against people and nations that have rebelled against God, uh, refused his mercy, refused his, uh, his grace. And, and again, I think for us is that if we accept the purpose of the first coming of the Messiah, which was to die for our sins, then we have to accept the purpose in his second coming as well, which is to pour out his, his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world to avenge the blood of all of those men and women and children that have died for their faith in Jesus Christ for the last 2,000 years and for martyrs that were, were beyond that. Of course, the first being Abel, the first martyr in the, in the Bible who was killed uh, for his faith in, uh, in, in God. But uh, again, just uh, a horrific scene. John takes a parenthesis in chapter 14 and, and says that this is what it looks like and, uh, and then he's going to start giving us more, more details in this last three and a half year, uh, year period. But, uh, you know, how do we answer the, the person that says, why does allow, God allow this suffering? And the answer is, he does because he is patient. But his patience will come to an end. When will that happen? Beyond anything any of us would ever endure in terms of patience. Uh, he will wait and wait and wait until it's compared to a harvest that's withered. It's so bad. And there's so evil, it's so ripe, overripe in this planet. And then he will come, then he will deal with it. And no one will be able to say it wasn't just and it wasn't fair. Everyone will know that it, that it was. And everyone will be amazed at the patience of God who has the power to end it but he waits because he's so interested and concerned that every man, woman, and child that will place their faith in him have the opportunity to do that even during the tribulation period. And um, in terms of how, you know, how, how should that uh, um, move us, again, I uh, tried to emphasize is we do have a tendency to get into the details of the events, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He will do these things. We should have a reverence and a fear and an awe of God when we worship him, when we pray to him, in how we live our lives and so forth. And then to imagine that it's that God that took on human flesh and, uh, and uh, was brutalized uh, at the hands of the Romans, went to a cross. All he had to do is say a word and it's all gone, all gone. Every man, woman, and child, just gone. Start again. The new planet, new creation. But he doesn't do it. The patience of God, the mercy of God is something we can see, even see in his second coming as well. Given up my